ASEAN. This story contains mature content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, I'm Atiyah Notajuddin, your host for Navigate ASEAN, a series of interviews with some of the region's leading public figures, brought to you by the ASEAN Post. In today's episode, we speak to Anna Malindok Uy, Professor of International Relations, Political Science, Southeast Asian Studies, and China Studies. She is also President of Tech Performance Court, an IT-based company in the Philippines. Anna has worked with multiple organizations, including the Asian Development Bank, and also is a regular contributor to the ASEAN Post. Today, we speak to Anna about the legacy of Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. Welcome, Anna. Good day to everyone. Okay, Anna. So um, when we talk about the legacy of um, President Duterte, the first thing that comes to mind is the war on drugs campaign. Um, in your opinion, has it been a successful campaign? Um, and did it achieve the desired results? From my own perspective, I'm, I know, as, as, as a Filipino, as an observer of the current administration um, fight against illegal drugs. In many ways, I would say that the fight against illegal drugs of the Duterte administration is relatively and in many ways successful. During the five years of the Duterte administration, the fight against illegal drugs took a considerable extent, has gained traction and made significant headway. For instance, based on data and statistics, the anti-illegal drug operation of the government from July 1, 2016, that's the time when Duterte assumed office, up to the present have generated significant critical results. One of the relative successes in the fight against illegal drugs is the more than 1.2 million Filipinos who voluntarily surrendered and had undergone drug rehabilitation and treatments. These are drug addicts, drug pushers, and all the kinds no, who are involved in illegal drugs. So that's a big, huge, uh, that's a, a big amount of or number of Filipinos who voluntarily surrendered. So that's that's I think one of the successes, no. Also, from July 2016 to May 20, 2021, this year. Around 3,736 3, children were rescued from anti-drug operations. As you know, in the Philippines, when you talk about drugs, it does not only involve adults. There are also a, long, a lot of young people who are into this. So this number is also significant to consider. Likewise, from July 2016 to May 2021, out of 42,000, 42, 42,042 barangays. No, barangay means villages in, in my country. It's equivalent to villages. Across the country, around 22,093 were proclaimed as drug-cleared barangays. So, yeah, these are numbers, no? These are actual numbers. And also, when you talk about um, uh, operations, anti-illegal drug operation conducted, even in the midst of the pandemic, it's around 200. 3,715 that was conducted and it was able to arrest 12,356 high value targets. No, this high value targets means really drug, big time drug lords or drug pushers no, in this country. So, in many ways, I would say um, it was relatively, relatively successful because until now you still have the drug problem and you cannot eradicate it overnight or even six years. It's, it's a big, it's a huge problem in the country. So I would say relatively successful. And to a certain extent, it was able to lower crime rate at around 64%. That's a big, it's a, that's a huge, no, that's a huge percentage. And this in some ways give comfort and a little bit of, well, it's not a little, but really a sense of security for many ordinary Filipinos that they can walk around the streets of Manila or any other metro cities in the country without fear. Because to a certain extent, the crime rate, especially when you talk about drug-related crimes, has been lowered significantly. So in many ways, I would say that in, in a way, it achieved its purpose. However, the problem of illegal drugs and the goal of eliminating this problem has a long way to go. I, I don't believe a one president, a one third president can resolve this you know, because of its enormity and sheer magnitude. So Anna, you mentioned a few numbers there and I would just like to pluck uh, data from the ICC. So according to the organization, since um, Duterte's election in 2016, 
between 12,000 and 30,000 civilians have been killed in connection with uh, anti-drug operations. The ICC has also authorized a full investigation into the president's war on drugs, which it says is a crime against humanity. So what are your thoughts on that? On the issue of ICC or the International Criminal Court authorizing a full investigation into the Duterte administration fight against illegal drugs, to be honest, really, no, if, if, if I'll be more honest about my answers, I see this is as akin to weaponizing the ICC against President Duterte by his political detractors or enemies. No? Just to note, the filing of cases in the ICC against Duterte was in, initiated primarily by the political enemies, so basically by the political opposition. Okay, the fight against illegal drugs is an internal affair of the Philippines. Also, the fight against illegal drugs is not synonymous with crimes against humanity. Why? Because it is a legitimate police action. And also even the figure that was presented, it's not, it does not match with the official records of the PNP or the Philippine National Police. It's way lower than that. I don't want to give figure on that because that is still subject to um, fine tuning, I think, in terms of figure. No, but I wrote an article about that actually. And I, I think and I think from my figure, I wrote it three to four months ago. It's around 5,000 to 7,000 no, deaths. And it's way lower than the one being presented in the ICC. Also, the state also, the state or the Philippine government have no intention to kill civilians. It's not a policy of the state or of the government. To note, the Philippine has no state sanction, killings, and that the country's independent court could prosecute alleged violation by police and law enforcement agency at any given time. Likewise, the Philippine is not anymore a member of the ICC. Okay, On March 19, 2018, the ICC was officially notified by the United Nations that the Philippines, the Republic of the Philippines, with, have written notification of withdrawal from the Rome Statute. The withdrawal took place on March 17, 2019. So in effect, the country is not anymore part of the ICC for the last, what, almost two years now. The Philippines is not a failed state, no? It, it, it has a fully functioning government. It has a fully functioning courts. It has a fully functioning um, investigative agency. So that's that's much more one of the argument being presented by the Philippine government. Um, it is but clear in the principle of complementarity in the I in which the ICC can only investigate crime against humanity if local courts are unable or unwilling to do so. But in this country, it's mm -hmm. not like that. It's far from that, no. Okay, Anna, so let's talk a bit about COVID-19 and the Philippines' economy. So back in 2019, the Philippines was one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and it was touted as the next um, Asian tiger economy. Um, but the country's economic growth faltered in 2020, entering negative territory for the first time since 1999. Of course, every other nation around the world experienced this because of the pandemic. But in your opinion, could the government have better managed the situation? Um, when you talk about the handling of the COVID-19, I'll be more upfront about this. No? Personally, I, 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 I am satisfied how the Duterte administration have managed no, and handled the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of its response and mitigation strategy. Despite the struggle, despite the many difficulties the whole country is still experiencing because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Relatively speaking, when you talk about fatality rate, the country has a very low fatality rate. It's below 2%. And when you talk about recovery rate, it has a very high recovery rate as well. Though in terms of the daily cases because of the Delta variant, um, two to three weeks or several months ago, like two months ago, I think, it, it, it shoot up. No, It was really high. But right now, if you look at it, it's going down. It has a downward trend. And I think the reproduction rate is also below 1% or around 1%. So that's already a very positive development. So in that case, you will see that given the limited resources that we have as a country, we're not an affluent country. We're, we're even like a middle income, but not even now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And given our limited resources, given our not, sophi not sophisticated and not so state-of-the-art 
health system no across the country in, in in my country in the cities you will see many hospitals that are very good but there are a lot of hospitals in the countryside which are not really good as well it's not because of the Duterte administration no it's really because the country was has that kind of not so good the healthcare system even before I, I I know because I I I lived in the province for several times when I was young. Now, so if you look at that um that kind of situation, still the country was able to manage. And and if you look at that as well, the country was able to um to have a not, yeah it, it was affected by the COVID nineteen pandemic. But when you talk about economy, it it's it is a floating. And I think it there's a promising um a uh, quick bounce back from the COVID nineteen pandemic because. Even though the growth of the, the economic growth of the country dropped last year, 2020, to as low as I think negative 17% in the second quarter of last year, because of of course of the quarantine and lockdowns. When you say lockdowns here in the country, really the economy was quite as close. No, no one is moving. We and our business we also we also have some losses. No, so it's really hard. But if you look at it now, this time around, it's slowly recovering. And according to the National Economic Development Authority, or what we call NEDA, who's in charge of you know plans for the economy, the country has uh, has quite has a latest growth rate of in the second quarter of this year of about a positive eleven point eight percent. This is quite a positive outlook when you talk about the goal of a quick recovery. No? So in, in that sense, I, would, I don't want to ask more from my government. What I think is important for me as, a, as, a, as an individual and as a Filipino is to ask what I can do more for my country. I mean, the government can only do so much with so much limited resources, given that there's, there are other problems in my country that has not has nothing to do with COVID-19. You, you see the country is also prone to calamities like typhoon, um, flash floods and all that. And this needs resources, no? And this exacerbates more the impact of COVID-19. So from my vantage point, I would say, no? Relatively speaking, I mean, the current government, it's not perfect. Of course, there are lapses from left and right. But I would say that to a greater extent, they have handled so far, no, and they're still trying to handle the COVID nineteen response in 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 many ways better than I was actually afraid before when 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 it initially hit the country because I was so afraid during the time that you know because of our healthcare system probably it will collapse anytime soon. But God, God willing and God bless, it's still. I mean, we're still okay. Yeah? We're still. I mean, Filipinos are still afloat, no? Okay, Anna, let's uh, move on to the 2022 Philippine presidential elections. I know you were excited to talk about this. So what do you think of the candidates that are running for office? Um, concerning candidates running for president in the 22 national election, like Senator Pan, Pan, Panfilo Lacson, Manila Mayor Isko Moreno, Senator Manny Pacquiao, you know, I'll be very honest, no. I mean, this is a very, this is a personal perspective and opinion. I see them really as traditional politicians. I, personally, I don't see them as viable candidates for the presidency. I don't see them as the most qualified candidates for president in this 22 national election. I don't see them as candidate with solid, experienced track record when it comes to leadership and governance and who have a tangible grasp of politics, the local politics and the international politics. Because in this day and age, it's not only local politics that matter, especially like a country like the Philippines. The international arena is also important, I think. No, And also these people, this politician, really, they really don't have really an understanding, and I think the grasp of the real tangible um, plight of the Filipino people. So in a way, I really don't, I'll be honest, I don't support these candidates. And if you ask me if I would vote for them, I won't. I'll be honest, I won't. And I really don't know what they have done for this country that really made a dent in terms of changing the lives of the Filipino people. They've been in office and they've been in power for so long, actually. But I, I in terms of, the things that they have done that that stick to your mind and that you know that made a difference i really i think i have to think more and more if i can think of something but as of the moment i really don't have that no so for me i really don't well it's a personal choice on my side i don't 
support them. And I don't see them as the most qualified candidates for, for the presidency. Okay, Anna, so I'm really interested to know this. So um, who are some of the top uh, choices for the next Philippine president? And who would you like to see running? My two top um, politicians or candidates for presidency, or let us say even for the vice presidency, is Sara Duterte and Bongbong Marcos, former Senator Bongbong Marcos. Okay, um, I think President Bongbong Marcos is running for president already you know i i just read um i mean one of my friends uh, told me just now that he is running for president so when you talk about candidates i would opt for sara duterte and bongbong marcos for the top two positions of the country no precisely because i see them i see them as leaders who have first and foremost um track record when you talk about leadership and governance they really have the track record and you can see it from their cvs i think no and second is they have um a, a more holistic education not only formal education but even the experience working on the ground look for example bombong marcos bombong marcos started as a vice governor of their province and he became governor he became congressman he became senator and he even candidate he ran for the vice presidency last 2016 election but unfortunately you know there was a lot of controversies about that so if you look at that there is really that background and track record no and sarah is one I think is the best um, chief executive of the local government. No, among the local chief executive, I think she's on the top of it. No, so you can see that, and you can see Davao, who is very progressive because of her leadership, of course, owing it to he, to to her father. So I see these two as the contenders, but I'm not sure if Sarah is running really for the highest positions of the land. No, but from what I know, Bongbo already said he will run for the presidency. So let us see, you know, let us see if my other candidate will be running. You know? So, um, and now let's talk a bit more about Duterte's legacy. Um, so in your opinion, what will be the lasting legacy for the Duterte presidency? And um, what do you think are some of his biggest accomplishments uh, in the past five years? In my opinion, at the tail end of his administration for over five years as president of the Philippines now, there are actually, because I've done a research on this, and I think I was commissioned to do a research, it's a regional research actually about the legacies of President Duterte and the other administration. So from my perspective, I think there are many legacies of the Duterte administration has done so far no, to contribute to the betterment of the country and the Filipinos. But for, I think the first thing that um, the, the Duterte administration will be remembered is the, um, is the, is the build, build, build program build 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 program which shepherd the age of infrastructure the golden age of infrastructure in the philippines by building and upgrading um railways train subways ports seaports airports bridges and building classrooms even for students this is very this is quite important because of the fact that the lack of infrastructure developed in the philippines has long been pointed out to be the weakest link in the overall economic development of the Philippines. For more than five years, uh, almost towards the end of this term, the Duterte administration has completed, no, let's let me give be, let me cite figures. Okay. It has completed 214 airport projects, 451 world-class seaport projects. The railway sector, the trains and the MRT, LRT was dramatically and significantly improved at, in this administration. And, the first, and for the first time in the history of the country, it is now constructing what you call Metro Manila subway. This is first ever in the country. I, I think other countries in Southeast Asia, they already have a subway. But this is the first time that the Philippines will be doing it. And I'm so excited about it because I think it will, you know, it will ease the traffic in Metro Manila. And the Duterte administration was able to construct 29,264 kilometers of roads, 5,950 bridges, 11,340 flood mitigation structures, 150,149 classrooms, 223 evacuation centers. Evacuation centers are very important in our country because it's, 
it's uh, nat- there are a lot of natural calamities that you know that visit our country every year so like typhoon a storm and every now and then people are evacuated in evacuation centers and then you have 1253 kilometer of new high standard highways and expressways in Luzon, Cebu, and Davao. So these are just some of the achievements no, of the Build, Build, Build program in, in the country. Why is it important, the Build, Build, Build program? Because, the car- because this will steer and drive economic recovery of the country amid the COVID-19 pandemic and in the post-pandemic era. And also to some degree, the enhancement, improvement of the, of the infrastructure in the country, to a certain extent um, connected by land, air, and sea, the islands. Because we're an island, you know, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So this, we need to connect all of them so that in terms of transport of goods and services, it's easy and even people. So it, it, it contributes to the economic activities of the country. So this is really important. And most of all, this makes us competitive internationally. Why? Because, of course, investment will come in because we have good infrastructure. And I think these are one of the important legacy of the Duterte administration. Another, I think, that is very important and landmark is, is the passage of Republic Act Number 10, 10931 or the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education. It is a landmark law that allows any deserving Filipino to enroll in any state universities all over the country free of charge. I think this is a very nice legacy. Why? Because even I, I studied in UP, University of the Philippines, when I was college, I was still paying tuition because the scholarship is only for those people who really are, you know, indigent Filipinos or, you know, low in terms of um, how they call it income of parents, no, it's really low, you can avail, but it's not even automatic. During my time, you need to apply. No, if you don't qualify, even if you need international assistance, yeah, you will not avail of it. But this time, you, regardless if you're wealthy or poor, mm-hmm. as long as you can pass the entrance exam, you can study. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but we would love to have uh, more discussions with you again in the future. My pleasure. Thank you for being with us today on our very first episode of Navigate ASEAN. You can follow us on our Facebook, YouTube, or other social media channels just by looking up the ASEAN post. Stay tuned for another guest personality next week. Thank you and have a good evening. Navigate ASEAN.